Hello and welcome to another edition of Theology Preparedness, or Theology Prepper. Uh, my name is John and we are working through a book called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. Uh, so to be theologically prepared is to be able to stand against what we face as Christians in the world today. Those attacks being of Satan and of sin and temptation are what plague us. Uh, so within this book by Puritan Thomas Brooks, uh, he gives us insight as to the attacks by which Satan comes at us. So that way in recognizing that pattern or that method of attack, we have something prepared in our hearts and in our minds to be ready to stand against such attacks. Um, today's attack that he mentions is that, well, sometimes it says by representing, this is chapter 8, by representing to the soul the outward mercies enjoyed by men walking in sin and their freedom from outward miseries. So, you know, we don't talk really much like that anymore. So what is uh, Thomas Brooks getting at? Well, he's saying, well, when you look around, you may be tempted to sin because you look around and you see other people walking in sin and they don't seem to have a care in the world. They don't seem to have bad days. They don't seem to be getting judged by you know, what they do, what they say, what's going on, uh, or in a non-Christian manner. They seem to be having a good, fine, and, and maybe even a somewhat spiritual life. So, uh, you know, maybe you're tempted to sin because you see people in sin not facing anything. And that, that does kind of bother us, doesn't it? It, it bothers us to not to see spiritual judgment or justice uh, in this life. And, and yet, for our own selves as Christians, we would say, well, that's the mercy of God that we don't get what we deserve. Um, and yet, you know, we do, in a sense, reap what we sow. So these kind of things we have to balance out when we're facing temptation and sin as to recognize what is going on in these situations. And Thomas Brooks gives us eight things to look at as we consider looking at sin in other people and maybe having a sense of temptation in ourselves to justify a sin or something because, well, other people don't seem to face anything, any repercussions for that. So the first one he says, we cannot judge of how the heart of God stands towards a man by the acts of his providence. Well, simply put, we could say, well, let's go to the book of Job. And would you judge Job by the providence or the actions that basically befell him? You know, no. And that's the lesson of Job, right? His friends get it wrong. They say, well, gosh, Job, you're going through so much hardship you must have done something really bad because you know you don't punish a child when they do good you only punish a child when they've done something wrong so you must have done something really wrong if god is visiting you with all of this affliction and the point of job is exactly the opposite god is testing job god is refining job and yet not based on his actions not based on his his evilness or something that he's done um but it, it's it's something between god and satan going on and proving the righteousness of job uh that under all of this affliction job still stands fast in his sin so just the opposite we shouldn't by the mercies or the good fortune you know, fortune luck stuff like that christian doesn't believe in those kinds of things but the good providence that is visited upon someone a non-christian even someone non-christian in their sin you know we can't judge that well god is blessing them it's like no not necessarily um, the, the very riches that they're enjoying or the pain-free life that they're enjoying uh, is to their detriment. You know, in a sense, you, we would use the expression, give one, someone enough rope to hang themselves. You know, they don't see the problem of their sin and nothing in their life is challenging them against that. So they think everything's fine. That's judgment to be blessed to that extreme then. 
So those mercies are actually working against their heart. So we can't say of God that the, the blessings or the misfortunes of people are an act of God's heart towards them. Uh, two, Thomas Brooks tells us, hey, nothing provokes God's wrath so much as men's abuse of his goodness and mercies. Uh, so we have to look at how the Bible sets up people as following God, not following God, and those who misuse and abuse the blessings God gives them. So let, let's, for sake of argument, we use the character of Pharaoh. You know, the Israelites under Pharaoh in Egypt right before the Exodus. Here's a guy blessed with riches, with a very powerful kingdom, probably the most powerful kingdom in the world of his day. So he would be the, the top dog, the pinnacle of king of kings in his time. And Pharaoh is greatly humbled. Well, why? Because although he had so much blessings and mercies on him by God in, in what he had, misused it, didn't he? He, he used it to oppress God's people instead of bless them. So he faced basically all kinds of ridicule and the plagues and everything else and losing uh, Israel. So in a sense, losing their entire workforce. Uh, and it plunged Egypt into, in modern day language, into a huge recession or depression, depending on how you want to look at it. And it was never the same since. Um, so in that sense, we, we have to be careful that when you're considering a temptation or a sin and you say, well, other people aren't getting judged with it. In fact, they seem to be getting away with it and enjoying themselves in it. Well, don't take that to mean God is blessing them to no end. God will take great offense to their misuse of his blessing them. Um, so then point three says there is no greater curse or affliction in this life than not to be in misery or affliction. So that's counterintuitive to us, uh, especially Americans. We want to seek, you know, the, the good life. Uh, we want to be at peace. We want to be comfortable. Uh, we want to enjoy life and all that it comes with. So to say it's a curse to not have some sense of misery or affliction. Uh, again, that goes against the grain. You, know, you, you almost feel that as like, Ugh, I don't really want misery and affliction though. And, and of course we don't want it, we don't seek it out. But yet as a Christian, you naturally have a sense of misery and affliction by just being in a world full of sin. It doesn't feel like your natural habitat, doesn't feel like you're naturally belonging or fitting in in this world because we don't, because it's cursed, because it's full of sin. Uh, and so to be comfortable in a world of sin and misery, to in a sense not seeing the sin and misery that's there, well, yeah, that would in a sense be its own curse. You don't see the things that are around you as a problem Therefore, you have no problem. Christians see the world around them and the problem it has. Therefore, they are always afflicted by the misery of that problem. Um, so again, another thing to watch for when you see or are faced with temptation about what's going on in the world around you and you think everybody else has it easy. For Thomas Brooks points out, the wants of evil men are far greater than their outward blessings. So what he's saying here is generally just because you see people in a sense getting what they want day by day and they're not facing any kind of afflictions or miseries for it. And so you're tempted to say, well, then why don't I do that? Hey, consider that those same people that as soon as they get what they want day by day are not satisfied by what they have their desires and their evil ways or whatever are going to keep sinking lower and lower and lower because they are not going to be satisfied with the things of this world. They, they can't be. Uh, us as Christians, we find our fullness, our satisfaction, our life, our love from and in Christ. And that does fill us up. 
to where as the psalm says or the hymn says uh, the things of this world grow strangely dim um, to them this world is the highlight of everything that there is it's what they live for and as they get pieces of it they can only want more because it's not going to satisfy so don't let that basically get a, a foothold in your life thinking that well if i just go ahead and give in to this sin not only are others enjoying it and not getting away with it oh there's no consequence to that no it's not going to fulfill you in any way shape or form either you're going after uh, what the scripture would say a waterless well or a cloud with no rain it's going to be empty five uh, thomas brooks says the outward things are not as they seem nor as they are esteemed that's kind of what we were saying in four uh, what they go after is empty um, so five is going after what they want or four rather was saying what they want is always going to keep growing and growing well that's because in number five those things are empty uh, so number six then god has ends and designs in giving even evil men outward mercies and present rest from sorrows and sufferings that causes saints to sigh so we can't get beyond what god is doing in someone's heart mind world life life view all that kind of stuff uh, so don't get wrapped up in it in other words we we don't go out of our way to compare ourselves to others anyway or we shouldn't be so in that sense your temptation is for you and it may not be what tempts other people and you don't know what god is using or going to use in someone else's life to convict them of sin to bring them to a knowledge of christ and maybe even you recognizing that is the opportunity to talk to them about those things you know hey does that really fulfill you well weren't you going after something else a week ago and you got that but now you're going on to something else these things aren't satisfying you spiritually or your life goals or whatever all that kind of stuff you know you don't need a better life coach you need to give your life to christ um, so those are the kinds of things we, we have to be careful about judging by outward view what we think we see is going on in someone's life and how god may be using that um, you know, we know how God worked in our lives and in my life, but that's not going to be the experience of everybody else. So we have to allow God to work as he works. Um, so that's uh, point six. Well, point seven, then Thomas Brooks tells us that, hey, when you're facing this kind of sin or temptation, God often plagues and punishes those whom others think he most spares and loves so uh, again it, it's the counterintuitive side it's like well you think god has this person on a plateau because nothing's bothering them and yet that may be that god is going to use that to plague and punish them more severely than others because now they have more to lose you know again back to our pharaoh example what made his punishment echo throughout the rest of the world when, when when israel leaves egypt and they're about to go into the promised land those nations those peoples have already heard about the nation of israel why because of how severely god dealt with egypt so hey so just because they were set up so high and you say wow egypt the blessing of god i mean look at how rich how expansive you know hey even you know you go back a couple generations to to joseph and so forth wow egypt was the only nation spared they got seven years of plenty and they stored that up for the seven years of famine wow god really blessed them to take care of them and other nations in the wake of that severe drought what about now you know it was were they held up on this high plateau only for god to say look i'm going to judge you so much more severely in front of everybody else because you're going to be a witness to that effect so we have to be careful that as you go after a sin or a temptation and you think well, i'm going to get away with it because everybody else is you may be setting yourself up for quite the judgment depending on what it is god says that you stand to lose 
or what in your sanctification benefits you by getting pulled out of your life as a result of maybe that sin. So, so think long term, you know, count the costs is what scripture counsels us to do. You know, what are you risking in giving into some sin or temptation? And the last point he has for us uh, is point eight. God will call evil men to a strict account for all the outward good that they have enjoyed. So everything that they've been blessed with that they've misused will have to give an account for. Uh, before the throne of judgment at the end uh, their day will come and just like the the parable of the talents and other parables of jesus in the new testament you know uh, uh, the householder the the homeowner the 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 owner of the house or the field or whatever he goes away and he puts people in charge of things there's a day of accounting when he comes back and holds them accountable and says what have you done with what i've entrusted you with and all they've done is done things for their own use, for their own good, or even the, at worst, uh, used and taken what they had uh, to use those things against others. They're going to have to pay the price for that one day. So don't get caught having to pay the price for your sins. Rest them upon Jesus. Look away from sin and temptation. And stand fast, as Thomas Brooks is counseling us to do when we face these things. That's it for this week, for this lesson. Uh, if you like what we're doing here, what I'm doing here, we, somebody right now, just me, uh, <laughs> like, subscribe, share, all that fun stuff. It helps the channel grow, as people say, and uh, we'll see where all this goes. God bless. Take care. We'll see you next time.